Paul's second presentation will be having with us Ms. Jun Xiu, who has more than a decade worth of working experience in a field of specific learning difficulties. She is currently a lecturer heading the DAS Academy and is pursuing a doctorate degree at the National Institute of Education, NIE, and the University College London Institute of Education, with a special interest in the topic of inclusion of children with mild learning difficulties in mainstream schools. She is committed to empowering parents, educators, and schools with knowledge and practical skills so that students with dyslexia can be given the best support to thrive. Ms. June will be presenting on Assessing Executive Function in Children with Dyslexia, Capturing Both Hot and Cool Executive Function. Ms. June, see you please. Okay, good morning everyone. Okay, uh, today I'll be talking about Assessing Executive Function. Okay, and um, I'll be addressing why both the hot and cool executive function both matter. Okay, let's look at the first one, the first um, okay, inhibitory control. Now, my first personal experience with executive function um, started when my child, when my son was three years old. He was in playgroup then and he was a biter. So he would bite whenever his friend tried to share his toy. Okay, he, um, and of course, I was embarrassed and very worried. Okay. He couldn't, at that time, he couldn't um, have the, the, the urge to resist his natural tendency to bite. Okay. And he, could, he didn't exhibit inhibitory control. So I was definitely, as a mother, very embarrassed and worried. But taking a look at the development of executive function, perhaps I didn't have to be so worried because executive function actually doesn't develop fully until uh, adulthood. Okay, so you can see that uh, from the graph that it peaks only in early adulthood. Okay, so for most of us here, our executive functions should have developed. Okay, but for some of us who are 30, in our 30s and older, I have not so good news for you. Because if you look at the graph, the executive function actually starts to decline when you are in your mid-30s. Okay? Um, but I have hope for you because later on I will share about some activities that can delay the decline of your executive function. Okay, now let's look at other components of executive function. We have working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold on to information and work with it. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to be uh, flexible with your ideas, to change gears in your thinking, and to unlearn your old ways of doing things. The ability to plan is the ability to sequence, prioritize, and focus on your series of goals. Okay, so let's take a closer look at how executive function looks like. Okay, um, for inhibitory control, very young children who have deficit in this area tend to have angry or tearful outbursts. Okay? Um, for teenagers, they might be very easily addicted to television, video games, card games. Uh, they might also exhibit impulsive behavior like fighting. And everyone, even adults who have inhibitory control deficits, will have difficulty delaying gratification. So perhaps that's why so many young Singaporeans are buying cars despite um, not having enough for their, their daily um, uh, needs. Okay? Now working memory uh, deficits can exhibit itself such as forgetting your friend's names or forgetting names of people you have just met. Uh, you, people with, as, uh, with working memory problems might have difficulty completing tasks, especially those that require multiple steps. They also have difficulty responding to oral questions in class, okay, because they have forgotten the question that has been posed. And they might appear very really disorganized and inattentive. Now, cognitive inflexibility 
can show itself in the various ways as shown here. Um, some people might become very upset when routines change, when teachers change, or when their group and uh, their seating arrangement changes. They can be very resistant to new approaches when the old ones do not work. They tend to think too much about one topic and find it very difficult to move on to another. They might not be able to concentrate on a few projects at a time because they are unable to switch gears. Okay. Um, difficulties in planning can manifest itself as being late for activities because they have difficulties in time management. Uh, they might not be able to find things and easily misplace their stuff. Okay. They might frustrate their friends if they are working with them in a project work or their colleagues in the office. Okay. And they can have trouble carrying out actions needed to reach goals. So you can perceive them as the, those big talkers. They tell you they want to do something, but usually they don't do it. But that's not because they are not keeping their promise, but it might be because they have difficulties in planning a sequence of activities to reach their goal. Okay. Now that I have um, spoken about the different factors of executive function, perhaps you might be a little confused. So what exactly is executive function? This pyramid here might help you. At the bottom, at the base of the pyramid, are your lower order processes, such as inhibitory control, selective attention, and cognitive flexibility. This lower level cognitive processes support your higher order cognitive processes, such as working memory, which in turn support an even higher order cognitive process which is problem solving. So you can imagine one needs to be uh, sufficiently inhibited, flexible, as well as have some emotional control before they can solve a problem efficiently. Okay, so in summary, executive function is really a set of mental processes that have to do with managing one's resources and goals. Uh, sorry. Um, it has to do with managing one's resources and yourself in order to achieve a goal. Okay, so you might expect that executive function brings about lifelong benefits. Um, the gains are not only in school achievement, but it brings about um, teamwork and adaptability. It brings about good health because you are more conscious about your, your choices for food and exercise. Um, it brings about a good career as well. Conversely, poor executive function can lead to peer rejection. Um, it can lead to poor academic performance, student dropout, crime, poor health, difficulty keeping a job, and poor social life. So you can imagine how important executive function is for someone. Okay. Now, um, the link between learning difficulties and executive function have long been established. Okay. In autism, uh, uh, children face difficulties in inhibition, planning, and self-monitoring. For children with ADHD, they tend to have difficulties in inhibition, maintaining attention, working memory, and planning. And for dyslexia, children with um, dyslexia tend to show difficulty with organization, uh, functions of inhibition as well, as well as cognitive flexibility. Okay, so this highlights to us that as um, practitioners in this field, we should not only be concerned with the educational needs or academic needs of our students, we need to be concerned about the executive function needs of our students as well, because they have an inherent deficit. So how is executive function usually measured? Psychologists have relied on cognitive tests such as the WISC, the NAPC or the Dallas Kaplan Executive Function Test to measure um, your executive function. Let's take a look at some components in the Dallas Kaplan Test. Okay, so this is the sorting test and it measures problem solving. Okay, now can you see the pictures from the back? Okay, 
Now, um, if you can't try to access the slides, okay, but um, it shows there are six cards here on the screen and there are eight ways to sort these cards into two groups. Can you think of the eight ways? Okay, now, so if you can't, or if you can think only like of four ways, maybe you just passed the problem solving test. Okay, now let's just take a look at the video to, um, to see some of the ways of solving this. Each group should be the same in some way. After you sort the card, cards into two groups, tell me how you did it. Be sure to tell me how you sorted both groups, not just one of them. Once you sort the cards one way, do not sort them that way again. Work as quickly as you can. Here is the page that will help you remember these rules. Ready? Begin. These belong to the head or on the head or face and these have to do with the feet. Now try to sort them in a different way. Um, these are similar in that um, the stripes are broad but these are more narrow stripes. Now try to sort them in a different way. These are black triangles, these are uh, clear or white triangles. Try to sort them in a different way. Um, these words have uh, are in the plural, these are singular. Now try to sort them in a different way. Um, for these, the black triangles are above. Um, for these, the black tri I mean, the triangles are above the uh, words, but these, the triangles are below. Thank you. Okay, so did you identify the eight ways, or you could only do some of it? <laughs> okay, so this is a test of problem solving. Okay, um, and probably you have an indication of how good you are at problem solving by doing this. Okay, uh, of course there's another way which is really to, did some of you notice the handwriting, the, the, the font of the letters. So some of it is in cursive, whereas some are printed. Alright, so that's how, that's another way you can sort the cards. Okay, now let's look at the next. Um, component of the test. Okay, this is a tower test and um, it measures spatial planning ability. Okay, so how good you are at planning. Okay, so what you have to do is that um, you will have to arrange the pieces according to what is shown in the, in, the, in the chart. Okay, so the goal is to arrange the pieces such that they look like the one in the chart. There are two rules. You can only move one piece at a time using just one hand and you can never place a big piece on top of a little piece. Let's take a look. Hours for you to build. For each one, work carefully so that you use the fewest number of moves possible. Remember, move only one piece at a time and never place a big piece on top of a little piece. Tell me when you have finished. Now make yours look like the one in this picture. Begin. Okay, so the least number of moves you make, the better your planning ability is. Okay, so based on this, how do you think you fare in planning? Good? Okay, now let's take a look at um, 
okay, what this executive function measures are really measuring. Okay? So you have seen for yourself um, and you have experienced for yourself what executive function measures actually measure. Okay? And um, you might have an indication of how efficient your mental processes are. Okay? So just like IQ tests, um, the executive function tests give you an indication of your, the efficiency of your mental processes. Okay, now, but unfortunately for IQ tests, although it informs you of your cognitive processes, it does little to predict your life success. Or maybe it's fortunate for some of us. Okay, um, for the executive function measures, it works in the same way. Okay, so while a child can perform very well in, in a, a laboratory setting, um, we are not so sure how the child actually performs in the real world. Because in the laboratory setting, um, there are no emotions involved. Whereas in the real world, there are emotions involved, there are stresses in life that can affect your executive function. So all these traditional executive functions have been criticized for lacking in emotions. Um, they are criticized by researchers for being devoid of emotions and um, being not ecologically valid. Okay, so let's look at what stress does to executive function. Now, we know that the prefrontal loop houses the executive function. And when you are tired, or when you are ill, or when you are stressed, your executive function is the first to suffer, and it suffers very badly. Okay? And so what the, uh, the previous test that I've shown you, okay, what they do is that they ignore the impact of stress on executive function. Okay? And so in the real world, because there is um, stress involved, um, what you perform, how you perform in the laboratory may not be reflective of how you will perform in the real world when there is stress. Okay, so um, through this experiment, you can actually see the differences in children's responses in executive function in two different contexts. Okay, a cool executive function situation and a hot executive function situation. So what the researchers did is to actually create this sort of environment. In the cool executive function situation, it's called cool because it's devoid of emotions. Okay, there are no stakes involved in there. Okay, so the researcher asked the child for advice. Can you help me solve a problem? And the child is a three-year-old child. Should I eat the candy now or wait and get four candies later? So of course, the three-year-old very cleverly told the researcher that you should wait, you know, so that you can get more candies for waiting. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the, the model answer, right? Okay, now, but when this child is actually placed in a hot executive function situation, um, and the researcher asked the child the same thing, except now the decision is on the child. Okay, so the researcher asked, do you want one candy to eat now or four candies to eat later? So guess what the child said? They chose to have that one candy immediately instead of waiting for more. Okay, so in the cool executive function situation, they gave the researcher very good advice, but in the hot executive function situation, they did not walk the talk, okay? And so this highlights um, the, the impact that emotions have on executive functioning. In the hot executive function situation, it's a high stakes situation. The child um, has something to lose or has something to gain and there are emotions involved, okay? And that changes the way they behave, okay? So now you can see that um, the cool executive function situation did not include the self, did not include the emotions, and did not include motivations. Okay. So it brings to us the importance of the hot executive function because hot executive function is really the application of executive function to everyday situations, and this is real. Okay. And for researchers, while we have previously relied on the, cold as a, uh, the cool executive function instruments, it is equally important to actually use the hot executive function task to measure 
executive function. Okay, but there are not many in the market. Okay, and um, the most popular one, the most um, the, the one that's most familiar to us is actually the brief. That is a uh, um, questionnaire um, for parents and teachers, and it consists many items, a series of questions, and parents and teachers are asked to rate how the child performs in this series of items. It is a test of executive function um, at home and in school. Okay, and so this is a standardized test that you can actually use for um, your student or your child. Okay, at the DAS Academy, we have also come up with a questionnaire, but although this is not a standardized questionnaire, it gives you an indication of the problem areas of executive function in the child. It also highlights the strengths of the executive functions of the child. Okay, so this is really just a snippet and an example of it. Okay, now, so having presented both the hot and cool executive function, um, it might seem as though as they are very separate constructs, but I would like to use Brief's model to uh, illustrate to you the, the relatedness of these two constructs. Okay, now, so Brief has urged um, educators to look at a to look at a learning difficulty at four different levels: um, the biological level, the cognitive level, the behavioral level, as well as the environmental level. That would help you better understand um, the, the the interconnectedness of all these levels. Okay, so at the biological level, um, we look at the imbalances in neurotransmitters that cause a learning difficulty. We also look at the gene markers for SPLD. At the cognitive level, we look at the cognitive processes of that individual. Okay? And um, we look at things like working memory, inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility, bulimic awareness, and so forth. And at the cognitive level, all these processes cannot be seen with the naked eye. They are implied through performance on tests uh, or through psychological reports. Okay. And then at the behavioral level, uh, you will actually see the manifestation of the cognitive deficits. Okay. So at the cognitive level, we call it the cool EF level. Okay. That is when you are just purely looking at your um, cognitive potential. Okay. And at the behavioral level, we are actually looking at the hot executive function because your behavior, uh, your behavior interacts with the school environment, the home environment, and the stress caused by all these environments. Okay, so hot and cool executive function are really both uh, two sides of a coin. They are same but different, and therefore, when you do um, the assessment of executive function, it is very important to look at both aspects, both sides of the coin. Okay, so earlier on, we have um, spoken about helping you to delay the onset of your executive function decline. Okay, so now I will share some ideas. Okay, so um, now there are interventions that have been shown to be effective for improving executive function, but most of them have focused on cool executive function. Okay, and let's just go through this first before I speak about the hot executive function. Okay, we know that computerized training programs has improved children's executive function, especially young children's executive function. Um, for adolescents and teenagers, the executive function-based cognitive behavioral training approaches have helped address issues such as poor time management, self-organization and emotional self-regulation. Okay, and um, certain curriculums have helped executive function as well. Um, Tools of the Mind in the US and the Montessori curriculum have all been documented to show improvements, to help show improvements in executive function development. Okay, now other than all this, um, for you as well, okay, if you wish to improve your cool executive function, you should engage in more physical activities such as aerobics, 
and um, uh, or take up a, a new dance, okay, uh, to train your brain. All right. So when you move your body, you actually train your brain. Okay. You could also take up traditional martial arts or kickboxing for the more adventurous one. Okay. Music training has also been shown to enhance emotional skills and executive function, so it's not too late to pick up piano now. Okay. And um, how many of you speak more than one language? Yeah. Okay. So I have good news for you because um, for the bilinguals, uh, your executive function is enhanced by your bilingualism. Okay. And it not only enhances your executive function, but it actually preserves your executive function longer during aging. So in other words, you, it actually prevents um, or even delay the onset of dementia. Okay. All right. So executive function can be trained and you should work at it. Okay. Now we have spoken about the hot executive function. Sorry, we have spoken about the cool executive function. Now, how about the hot executive function? Um, this, there is uh, lesser coverage on this in terms of research. So for those of you who wish to actually study this, there is a gap in this field. Okay? Um, improving hot executive function can be done by putting in rewards to encourage desirable traits. Okay, so if you are hoping that your student can develop cognitive flexibility by using a new strategy to solve this math problem, perhaps you want to put in uh, a reward to entice this child to do it. Okay, or you might, um, in situations that you cannot place rewards, you might want to remove the hot and desirable distractions so that they do not have to work so hard to stay focused. It is as simple as removing the handphone from the study table. Okay? Um, some games can help hot executive function as well because games um, introduce an element of competition and stress. Okay? And so in, in a climate of competition and stress, um, it's a very hot and emotionally charged situation. And when you get kids to actually exercise their executive function, it improves it. Okay, let's take a look at this game, Spot It. Okay, some of you might have played with it before, okay, but um, it's really quite a fun game and it's good for your brain. You have three seconds to find the matching symbol between these two cards. Go! Okay, so you have three seconds to find matching symbols between these two cards. Can you find it? Your this time is, is the ticking. essence of Spot It, the fun and fast-paced party game. Okay, so did you find it? How many of you found it? Okay, not bad. So all these are those with good executive function. <laughs> okay, now this is a very challenging game and it, it can be played with all children of all ages. Because it's really simple. Okay, and so what you have to do is really to spot the similarity in two cards. There is definitely one match in two cards. Okay, so what happens in this game? You have to inhibit your, the distractions of the bigger object because some of the objects are actually bigger than others. So your eyes automatically go to the larger objects. But you have to inhibit that. Okay, um, your eyes also automatically go to the objects with brighter colors. And you have to inhibit that to focus on your goal of looking for a similar object. Okay, so in this very simple game, um, it involves a lot of cognitive processes and it's really quite good um, for developing executive function. Okay. okay, now, so other than this game, uh, you should also give children a chance to practice and grow their executive function in emotionally charged situations that they can manage. So if your child is going into P1, entering P1, and you're afraid that they might make unhealthy choices during recess, like getting soft drinks or getting the fried foods, you can actually um, practice decision-making before that. So you can bring them to a food court and ask them to choose, uh, and ask them to choose between two choices, which is a healthier choice, steamed chicken rice or fried chicken. 
Okay, so there, there are stakes involved in that situation, but if you can expose them to um, the stresses of making a choice when there, there, there are stakes involved, when they are alone, they can actually do better at executive function. Okay, so all this practice will help. And then finally, contextualized role play can also help. Remember I was telling you about my son who was biting at three years old and that got me really worried. Okay, um, what I did was to use contextualized role play to help him um, model alternative ways of behaving. So I taught him how to negotiate for the toy rather than just biting immediately. Okay, and so all this has helped um, children develop their hot executive function. So I think um, this brings me to the end of my talk. I have highlighted for, for psychologists, I have highlighted the importance of both hot and cool executive functions in assessment. And for practitioners, um, while you work on the cool executive function skills, do not neglect the hot executive function skills in your students. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. June, for the enriching presentation on executive function. We'd now like to invite Ms. Fanny again to present a token of appreciation to Ms. June.